as often stated in our study of Romans, the first part of Romans is as complete and concise a statement of the Christian doctrine as there is in the Bible. And the last part of the book is where the doctrine gets translated into shoe leather, describing the walk of the Christian according to what they believe. And so we see in this last chapter of Romans, chapter 16, the evidence of those walking in the Spirit in their Christian love, their Christian labor for the Lord, their Christian service and ministry in the church, and their Christian character. And in this chapter, we get a glimpse of what it was like in the early churches of first-generation Christians, especially those who lived in the Roman hotspot of persecution. This chapter contains Paul's greetings to 27 Christians who lived in Rome. He lists them by name without regard to station in life, except as it advanced the gospel and built up the church. Although this chapter consists of Christian courtesies addressed to different individuals, yet it was written by an apostle and it was written not as an ordinary letter, but as part of the God's inspired word. Therefore, there must be valuable matter in it. And though when we read it, it may appear to be uninstructive, there must be edifying matter beneath the surface because all scripture is given by inspiration and is meant to benefit us in one way or another. So we'll start with verse one. I commend to you the church in Rome, our sister Phoebe, a servant, a deaconess of the church, that is the little congregation at Centria. So Phoebe was a Gentile woman. She was named after the Greek goddess of the moon. Her name means radiant or shining one. And she's carrying Paul's letter to the churches in Rome. As we see, there were deaconesses in the early church, and it was their business to attend to the female converts at baptism, to instruct the catechumens, that is, the persons who were candidate for baptism, to visit the sick, and to visit those who were in prison, and in short, perform the religious offices for the female part of the church, which could not, with propriety, be performed by men. They were chosen in general out of the most experienced of the church and were ordinarily widows who had borne children. Some ancient church bylaws required them to be 40, others 50, others 60 years of age. And there was evidence that they were ordained to their office by the laying on of hands and prayer. By the 10th or 11th century, uh, this practice had disappeared. Centria, where Phoebe lived, was a seaport on the east side or the Aegean Sea side of the Isthmus of Greece. Lycaeum was the seaport on the west side or the Ionian Sea side of the same Isthmus, and there was a shipping canal between them. They were six miles apart, and the great city of Corinth, where Paul was when he wrote the book of Romans, lay between them. So they were only about two to three miles from Corinth. These cities were situated well for commerce, and so they were very rich. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, a deaconess of the church of Centria, now, it was common in those days when you were traveling to carry a letter of commendation with you so people would know who you were. So Paul commended Phoebe to the church of Rome that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron, that is a helper, of many and of myself as well. Now, apparently Phoebe was a woman of ability. She was a businesswoman on her way to Rome. And Paul suggests that the church in Rome would be available to assist her in whatever way she needed, 
while she was there. In a worldly community, one very important point of interest about a person is how much is that person worth? Uh, that's also an important point with Christians, too, if you take it in the right sense. But in the worldly sense, it means how much money has that man accumulated? What family does he come from? Well, who does he know? Uh, the points of interest with Paul as a Christian were very different from those. And the first matter of which he made honorable mention here was in service to the church. Phoebe in the first verse is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. She's been a help to many and of myself also. Then in verse three, Paul continues, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Notice that Priscilla's name is first, which is very unusual and countercultural in the world at that time. The Christian church beginning with Jesus had a radical view of the status of women. Jesus demonstrated that he valued women and men equally as being made in the image of God. Luke, Dr. Luke, clearly indicates Priscilla's partnership relationship with her husband. She is certainly not Aquila's property, as was customary in Greco-Roman Greco society, but rather his partner in ministry and marriage. They were a married Jewish couple that Paul met in Corinth after they were banished from Rome by the edict of Emperor Claudius. They helped Paul found the church in Corinth. They were tent makers like Paul who ran a very profitable business since awnings were in fashion in Rome. And Paul lived with them for about 18 months. We know that Aquila and Priscilla moved to Ephesus where they met a young man named Apollos. Uh, this couple appeared to have an advanced understanding of the gospel. For in Acts 18, we find Paul indicates the young evangelist Apollos is an eloquent speaker who had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, he says, and he taught it with great enthusiasm, he says, and he began to preach boldly in the synagogue. However, he knew only the baptism of John the Baptist and not the baptism taught by Jesus. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Now, after Claudius died, uh, Priscilla and Aquila returned to Rome for a season before then returning back to Ephesus. And it's likely that their occupation of tent making necessitated having a large room in which to carry out their work. Uh, so they formed home churches and used their home wherever they lived. So greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all of the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. So greet also the church in their house. People have tried to trace back in history to establish uh, when the transition from home church to church houses occurred. And the best they've been able to figure out is uh, the church houses came into being in the third century. Then he says, greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the very first convert to Christ in Asia. So you can imagine the special fondness that Paul had for the very first person he won to Christ in Asia. But that's all we know about him. It's interesting that the archeologists have discovered an inscription in Rome with the name Epinetus, the Ephesian in it. Verse six, he says, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. 
So another special point to remark among Christians is their labor. This is the sixth Mary mentioned in the Bible. It says she bestowed much labor on us or on me. So she was one of those useful women who took personal care uh, of the preacher's needs and those that were traveling with him. So what she did for Paul and fellow laborers were not told, but it was something that cost her effort and amounted to much labor. And verse 70 says, Greet Andronicus and Genia, my kinsmen, and Watts, my fellow prisoners. They were well known to the apostles, and they were believers in Christ before me. So Andronicus and Genia represent part of a Jewish household. Perhaps they were actual kin to Paul, and they were converted to God before Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus. And they were well known to all of the apostles, Peter, James, John. And I wonder, as I study this, were they there in Jerusalem at Pentecost? Were they targets of Saul of Tarsus' fury against the church? Uh, history has a record that they traveled Pannonia which uh, today would be Western Hungary, Eastern Austria, parts of Croatia, Serbia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina. And uh, they're recorded as winning many to Christ and destroying many temples to false gods. You know, just like was the case for Adronicus and, and uh, Jenny, uh, perhaps you have a relative who is very much opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's even more reason to pray more persistently for him. Because if God can make an apostle out of a persecutor like Paul, he can make a person who once rejected God a sincere lover of his truth. So it encourages us to pray on and pray hard and pray believing for your relative. Verse 8. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Ampliatus and Urbanus uh, were common slave names in that day. And they found an inscription in 115 AD that has the name Urbanus next to the name Ampliatus in a list of imperial freedmen that they found in the catacombs. Imperial freedmen were former slaves of the emperor who had amassed wealth and social status, be it lower than the old senatorial families. He said, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved of Christ. Apelles is a typical Jewish name. And in history, he's found among the dependents of the emperor. And approved in Christ means his fidelity to Christ had been tried and had stood the test. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Aristobulus was grandson of Herod the Great. Notice it did not say salute Aristobulus. No, salute those that are of his household. Those were his slaves. Uh, never before in history had slaves been considered brothers or equals in the faith. And the question is, why did they leave Aristobulus out? It's possible that he was dead, but for more likely, he was unsaved. He was left out of the apostles' salutation because he had left himself out. He was no believer and therefore could not be saluted as a Christian. Uh 
it's kind of sad that uh, as near as the kingdom of God was to him, uh, he was not blessed by it. Greet my kinsman Herodian, probably a free man of Herod, who took a variation of Herod's name, much as the freed slaves did in the U.S. of their master. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family, the household of Narcissus. Narcissus was the master of the house. The converts in the house were servants and slaves. There was a Narcissus in the day of Nero who was put to death by Nero's successor. He was Nero's favorite. And as you might surmise, he was not a man of commendable character. It's said that he was extremely rich and he was as bad as he was rich. Yet while the halls of his house echoed with uh, blasphemous songs and luxurious gluttony mingled with unbridled licentiousness uh, that made his mansion like hell. There was praise and worship and love in the servants' halls in the serve slaves' dormitory. Verse 12, greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Their names translate delicate and dainty. And they were apparently twin sisters born in well-to-do home. When I was a child in Newcastle, Texas, the Adams sisters were our Tryphena and Tryphosa in the church. Two humble, earnest, faithful women serving the Lord. Uh, the Greek word indicates that they worked so hard that they wore themselves out. Greet the beloved Persis, who had worked hard in the Lord. Persis was probably a slave. She's from a strange race from the far off land of Persia, but she was so excellent in her disposition that she's called the beloved Persis. And for her indefatigable industry, she received a special mention. May all of us be helped to labor much like Persis by the power of the Holy Spirit, of course. And I don't suppose Tryphena and Tryphosa got angry because the apostle made a distinction, but it is very plain and we can see explicit. Uh, the first two labored and Persis labored much. <laughs> So it's an honor to labor for Christ. It's still greater honor to labor much. Verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. They were all chosen, but perhaps a better translation is an eminent and choice man in the Lord, which reflected on the quality of character that made him an outstanding person among his peers, and also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Now, theologians try not to get too far fetched, but conjecture in supposing that this good woman was the wife of Simon the Cyrenian uh, that carried the cross of Christ. If you remember in Mark, it said Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus, two persons who evidently were well known in the church of God at that time. But whether she was the wife of Simon or not, she seemed to have been a kind, good, lovable soul, an excellent woman, so that Paul, when he calls her the mother of Rufus, adds, and mine, meaning she's been like a mother to me. Verse 14. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, 
and all of the saints who were with them. Apparently these were some of the different church groups in Rome. Their church groups were small, met in homes. Uh, and really of these persons, uh, there's really not anything known. Even the names of some are so ambiguous that we don't know whether they were men or women. Uh, but they were persons well known to Paul and undoubtedly were such as had gone from different places where Paul had preached or traveled or, and they had settled in Rome. One thing that we may remark at this point is that in all of this, there's no mention of Peter who according to the Roman and the papistical catalog of bishops must have been in Rome at this time. So if he wasn't in Rome, then this whole story that's been painted by the Catholic Church falls apart. But if Peter were in Rome at this time, you would have thought that Paul would have sent him a salutation uh maybe first of all and it's likely if peter were there that he would have been a member of the church like in the house of priscilla and aquila uh it's very unlikely that peter was far from being the universal bishop of rome that he never even saw the city in his whole lifetime. As scripture clearly says, Paul was apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was apostle to the Jews. And we know that Peter wrote first and second Peter, the epistles while he was in Babylon, which at that time was the major center of Jewish people. Verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss, which was the tradition at that time, before shaking of hands. And since the coronavirus, maybe we don't even have that. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught avoid those people you know scripture says in proverbs chapter 6 there are six things that god hates seven that he abhors and one of those is those people who cause division into the church verse 18 for such persons do not serve the lord christ but their own appetites and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive for your obedience is known to all so that i rejoice over you but i want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil the god of peace will soon crush satan under your feet the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you now paul proceeds now to uh, send greetings from the others in Corinth. And he starts in verse 21 with Timothy, my fellow worker, he greets you and so does Dr. Luke, his fellow traveler and Jason. It's likely that Jason is the same person mentioned in Acts 17 verse seven who was from Thessalonica and he received the apostles into his house. He befriended them and it was at risk of both his property and his life. And Sosis Potter, my kinsman, he was from Berea in Macedonia. He was the son of Pyrrhus the Jew and he accompanied Paul from Greece to Jerusalem uh, when Paul was taking the funds to the poor in Jerusalem. Verse 22, I, 
Tertius, who wrote this letter. <laughs> so he was Paul's scribe. He's known as a scholar, and people still admire the beauty of his writing. He says, I greet you in the Lord. So isn't that interesting? This man, the Amanensis, the scribe, adds a little footnote at the bottom of Paul's letter to introduce himself to the fellow Christians in Rome. And Paul continues, Gaius, he greets you. He is the host to me and to the whole church. Paul baptized Gaius. He must have been well to do since Paul and all those that traveled with him stayed at his house and ate at his table. And then not only that, but he was taking, he took care of the whole church. Verse 23, Gaius, who is host to me, and the whole church greets you, Erastus, the city treasurer. He knew everybody in the city of Corinth, and everybody knew him. All the city taxes and revenues flowed into him, and all of the city bills were paid by him. And our brother Quartus greets you. How little we know about Quartus. Yet, yeah how much we know. His name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He had the affection of the whole church as a brother. And one day we'll see him and know him and greet him in heaven. The whole church greets you. That is, some of them were Gentiles. Some of them were Jews. Some of them were Romans. Some of them were Greeks. Some of them were freedmen, some of them were slaves, some were affluent like Gaius and Erastus, some were poor. But they're all in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world had never seen such before. They'd never heard of such. There were fair-haired Goths and swarthy Arabians, Roman conquerors, cultured, sophisticated Greeks, untaught barbarians, Jews who looked up on themselves as the chosen of God, Gentiles that the Jews called dogs. They were all in the church together. It really was a development that the world had never seen. And then we come to the doxology. Now to him who is able to strengthen you in the faith, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery of the church that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. And that is the end of the lesson. And that is the end of our study of Romans.